Well, good evening to everyone. Nice to see all the names appearing on the screen. Those that I know and those that I'm starting to recognise um, because you've been with us for the series and one or two new ones as well. So as always, we'll plan to start at seven. And um, in the meantime, you can do exactly what you're doing and either gobble your tea down behind the camera or uh, just gather a moment of, of quiet. Um, what I'll do is um, I'll just set the screens going again. I'll share the slides that I was currently sharing, which are just giving me a little more information about our charity. Um, we don't want to take up valuable time during the session doing this, but we know it's quite useful for you to just, just to know a little bit more about us. And I hope it will also be a resource for you um, in the weeks and months to come. Um, so the website is quite straightforward. You'll see it at the bottom there, www.limeresourcecentre.com. And we've intended it to be useful, not even just for patients, but for health professionals, for researchers. So we've gathered the information there and we're continually working on it. Um, our team, it's a small charity, but we're growing with the number of people and volunteers and help that we have and starting to rethink making roads with meetings with Scottish government, meeting outdoor groups and um, those who run the councils and the country parks for awareness raising about how people can better protect themselves. And of course, a key role we believe is to work with yourselves as health professionals to try and make the information on Lyme disease, tick related infections much more accessible to you so that you know where to find the information really quickly. So that's a big focus that we have too. And so we're trying to build the information on the website. This is some of the, the speakers that you've heard up until now, weeks one and two. And of course we're into week three and we're very glad to have Monica Wild join us from Napier's Herbalis. More of that later. And uh, our speakers from previous nights, um, most of them will be here to take any other questions that you may have thought of in the Q&A about eight o'clock tonight. And so over the last three evenings tonight and the two before, these are the learning outcomes that we hope you would feel confident in being able to approach. But uh, that was our goal. And I hope by the end of tonight, that that's exactly how you'll you'll feel that we've achieved that in helping you. And I think I jumped one there, yes. So the Q&A at the end of the evening, um, we're going to open the chat box. We, we keep it closed until then, but we know that most of you have been listening intently with the questions come in after eight o'clock. So we'll ask you to, to do that, put your questions in the chat box and come in about eight o'clock and our speakers the two from tonight, Professor Lambert and Monica, um, will be there as well as um, Dr Anne Cruikshank, who I see is here already. And we may also have uh, Dr Zara Hussain online too. And they'll happily stay on a little beyond 8.15, but we know if you've had a long day, you may wish to exit at that point. And of course, you can always email into the, the Lyme Resource Centre itself. And if you have particular questions for information or um, you know, to be able to take you to sources of further information or research, we can try and guide you on that. Some more educational resources, just as we're mentioning. Um, Anne Cruikshank, the GP, who was a very much our, our initial speaker and clinical champion for the toolkit and the Lyme disease work that's happened at the RCGP. Um, we have put on here the toolkit link because it's really important that you as pharmacists, as GPs, as practice nurses want to be able to have access to that really quickly. And there's also a section with all the published research papers about Lyme and related tick-borne illnesses. And we've also got some extra educational um, resources there for you. Questions and answers from Professor Lambert in the sh short video form. So it only takes you a few minutes to look at those. So please go and have a look at our website after the event tonight. We would love you to come and make use of what's there for you um, to help build your knowledge around Lyme disease, tick-borne infections. 
And then in terms of awareness raising, which uh, is equally important, I'm sure we all agree that prevention is always better than cure. So we have lots of awareness materials that can be displayed in your practices. And we just have to use the online request form and we'll get those to you. We've got leaflets, we've got posters, and you can also download them yourself if you prefer to do it that way. But please do make use of them and, uh, and use them. And this is tonight's programme. We're going to be having two more speakers to bring you deeper into the, the Lyme disease questions, the challenges and um, using case studies and clinical situations. Professor Lambert's going to take us through those and then Monica will follow by introducing you to integrative medicine and its place in the management of Lyme disease symptoms. So that's tonight's programme. Sometimes you sign up to these events, don't you, all three, and then you forget what the detail is in each one. It's always good to remind you. And as a charity, um, we don't need to say it as a charity, we're obviously dependent on donations, fundraising and so forth. So if you've benefited from tonight, and there's absolutely no compulsion at all in this, but if you would like to support us in some way, then we would welcome that. And these are some of the ways you can do it by you know, talking about the charity to those that might be able to benefit from it, from some of the awareness materials, etc. If you're somebody that likes to run marathons or bake cakes or whatever, and you want to have a, a useful source for your fundraising, then we would love to be the recipient of that. Um, and again, if you want to donate directly, there's various ways you can do that. And our website's got all those uh, ways for you by text or by um, donations on PayPal, etc. One of the more timely ones, perhaps, is those of you who like to buy your Christmas cards early and get organised. We do have, for the first time this year, some Christmas cards with the LRC logo on it, again, to help raise awareness. But if you've not bought your Christmas cards, why, why not consider them um, through Lime Resource? And of course, we'd love to keep you involved and in knowing exactly what's going on with us as a charity. And any of you who would like to get involved, um, we would love to have your help and interest. So that's the, the bit about our, uh, our charity. Of course, there'll be an evaluation form, isn't there always with educational events? But it's good practice because we want to hear from you what you thought of the evening. So um, Gordana has already emailed that to you and you'll hopefully have it in your email box. And we'd love to have your feedback. Um, all sorts of constructive feedback is most welcome and um, we do act upon it and try and change things to improve. And just a wee quick reminder that we do record the session primarily for your benefit, because we have promised to make the um, recordings available to you after the event. And Gordana has hoping to send that out to you in about a week or so's time. So everyone who's registered will be able to get access to all three weeks. So we are going to um, just finish this presentation now. If I can just escape from my screen and stop sharing. There we are. And in the next minute or two, we will just start our evening and introduce you to the speakers for tonight. A few more people just entering the waiting room, so we'll just give them a moment. Another couple coming in. Okay, so we've we've gathered a few of you. So on that note, I'm going to say a very warm welcome to our third and our final series of the, the webinars we've been running on behalf of Lyme Resource Centre. Delighted to see so many of you returning for the third time. There's one or two new faces I can see and uh, just delighted to have you with us tonight. Um, I can promise you that you're going to get lots of new information and um, it will build upon 
number one and number two, if you were able to join us for that. Um, if you were with us week one, we previously looked at diagnosing and managing Lyme disease in primary care. And Dr. Anne Cruikshank took us through that presentation, which very much focused as well on the toolkit that's available through the RCGP website to GPs. And we have a link on our website too, to help you. And then we had uh, Dr. Rachel Clellan, a GP down south as well, who brought us her own personal experience of bites and Lyme disease. So as both a doctor and as a patient. And then last week, we um, looked at the challenges of diagnosing and treating Lyme disease. So we took it a bit deeper and Dr. Zara Hussain, she took us through some of those challenges and she's here with us tonight. So when we get to Q&A, Zara can also be available for any of your questions. And then Professor Jack Lambert, who's our lead trustee at Lyme Resource Centre, he took us even deeper into that whole question of the complexities and the, the challenges of diagnosing Lyme disease. And tonight, of course, he's going to continue his journey with us, looking at persistent infection with Lyme disease and other tick-borne infections. And he'll do that using case studies and clinical observations. And then to close our series tonight, we have a slightly different ending from the norm that you perhaps would be used to. And we've got a medical herbalist here, Monica Wild from Napiers, um, who's extremely knowledgeable about her field. And she's going to describe to us the role of integrative medicine in managing persistent Lyme disease symptoms. So a full programme for the next hour, as always. So we're going to record the session so we can make them available. We're going to mute you all as we've done previously, just to improve the sound for everyone else. Um, so please don't be offended at that. If you've got questions before eight, the eight o'clock um, start, please put them in the chat box to Anne Cruikshank and she'll collect them. But by the time it comes to eight o'clock, we're going to open the chat box for you all to, to type in any questions you have that we can, we can all see. Um, just a wee quick reminder, if you need your CPD certificate, um, this particularly refers to those GPs in, the, in Ireland. Would you put your name in the chat box, please, and address it to Tina McHugh, and Tina will make sure she gets that organised for you. So on that note, my introduction is done. I am having welcomed you all again, and I see many more of you joining you, joining us, rather. So let me reintroduce to you Professor Jack Lambert. Many of you met him last week, but just for those of you who are new tonight, let me just recap for you. Um, Dr. Jack Lambert, he's a consultant in infectious diseases, and he's been practicing in Dublin um, as a consultant at the Mater and Rotunda Maternity Hospital. And he also has a teaching appointment at UCD School of Medicine. Um, from 2010 to 2018, he was the director of the National Isolation Unit for Highly Infectious Diseases at the Mater Hospital. And he's pre presented widely in the field of Lyme disease and co-infection over the last few years through the EU and USA conferences. And so I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Lambert again, and he's going to continue his journey with you. Um, tonight as we look at Lyme disease and co-infections. Dr Lambert. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Gordana, can you put up my first slide, please? Okay, so the title of my presentation tonight is Persistent Infection with Lyme and Other Tick-Borne Diseases, Reviewing the Evidence for Further Treatment. And what I wanted to do was through, go through a just some recent, actually, case studies of patients that I've seen. Um, and, then, um, and then I'll just go into some of the information available on the subject. So next slide, please. So th this first slide just shows that, that pe people think ticks are rare, but ticks are all over the European Union, if not worldwide. And actually, with global warming, they're expanding their, um, their habitats. And additionally, they're staying around for a longer period of the year. Okay, um, so next slide, please. So case, case number one, 35 year old school teacher from Mayo in County Mayo, Ireland. She noted a mark on her right leg, May 9, 20, 2019, 
followed by neck, shoulder pain, flu, fatigue, night sweats, poor sleeps. Um, she had to take time off work. She went to the GP. GP considered Lyme, but the test was negative times two. Um, a second GP agreed to a course of doxycycline, um, which is look, based on what we discovered last week was the right thing to do, um, but gave her, her only two weeks of doxycycline at that time. Next slide. And this is the slide, this is the picture that she took for me of the rash. It was on the ankles, it was, so it was a bit elliptical, but it, it appears to be kind of a classic bullseye rash. Next slide. She did respond to the doxycycline, slightly improved, but her symptoms persisted. And then again, the rash, exactly the same rash, went away and came back again in October. She was told then by the GP that she'd been tested for Lyme. It was negative. She didn't have it. She, then, she was referred to a dermatologist who said you did not have Lyme and declined to do a biopsy. So she continued on well, off of work. She's a school teacher, professional woman, worked for 10 years of her life without missing a day of school, but she over the period of the next year, debilitating fatigue, muscle aches, poor concentration. She was brain scanned, every test done, all tests were negative during the hospitalization. She booked an appointment to see me and four weeks before seeing me, she went to the ID consultant uh, locally uh, who told her, forget about Lyme, go to your GP and get them to prescribe six months of antidepressants. She had, in the meantime, she'd done the German tests for Lyme and the ID doctor refused to look at them, says we don't recognize those tests. Next slide. Um, so this was the rash that came back again. Uh, and also she had an additional rash in her leg. So this was after it went away and recurred after being treated with uh, the antibiotics. Next slide. So in my evaluation in September, just she had symptoms of freezing cold, poor sleep, anxiety, palpitations, poor concentration, muscle aches, exhaustion, occasional palpitations. The bloods I did, I just got them back. They were all normal. And I reviewed the German test that she had done, and it was positive for Borrelia, positive for another infection called mycoplasma, which also can um, uh, have similar type symptoms. So I don't have an answer to, to what's happened to her yet. She was started in combination antibiotics, LDN supplements. And to date, she hasn't been treated by the NICE guidelines. She had a rash suspected to be a tick-borne infection. Uh, despite negative antibody tests from the Irish tests, she, the guidelines said she should have been treated with three weeks of antibiotics and then given additional three weeks of um, amoxicillin if she didn't respond to according to the NICE guidelines. So I'm hoping um, based on my follow-up appointments, I'll, I'll be able to give you a follow-up on our clinical response to treatment. Next slide. Case number two, 29-year-old Irish male from North Tipperary studying at the National University in Maynooth. Um, he showed up in the emergency room because he had the onset of flu, aches and pains all over, and he was taking a shower and he noticed this large bullseye rash in his back. He went to the emergency room where he was seen by an ID consultant. He was told it couldn't be Lyme by the infectious disease time team. They, they said the rash was the ECM rash was too big. And my 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 question is how how long how long is a piece of string? Sometimes the rash is small, sometimes the rash is big. She was sent, he was sent to outpatient dermatology and rheumatology for appointments. Next slide. Seen by the dermatologist and rheumatologist in private consultation in the next week, who's, who both assessed this was Lyme disease. Um, clinical diagnosis, Lyme disease. You don't need an antibody test to make the diagnosis. Sent them back to the emergency room. I received some, a call from my buddy uh, in the emergency room, an AMU consultant, Kate, who I actually trained with many years ago in Rochester, New York. Says, Jack, we have a dilemma. Your ID same sims, this is not Lyme. Both dermatology and rheumatology think it is life, Lyme. Um, advice from me, do a blood test because it's been long enough now and maybe it'll be positive. Start in doxycycline, standard dose, 100 BD. Book an appointment to come back and see me in the infectious disease clinic. Next slide. Came back one month later, all joint pains, fever's gone, systemic symptoms gone, rashes gone. Of interest, the Lyme was test positive. The Lyme test was positive, both in our laboratory, which is the National Virus Reference Laboratory, and it was also sent to Porton Downs. 
So I attempted further discussion with my ID consultant, who I trained actually a number of years ago. Um, the, the, the response was the rash was too big to be CCM. He did not see the tick. Uh, most people don't see ticks in their back unless they examine themselves with uh, mirrors frequently. And the response was, I don't want to discuss it. So we never had a collegial discussion. I was hoping for a discussion discussion. But the patient is cured of Lyme, Lyme despite the initial ID input, not because, because of the ID input. And my, my opinion from this is how can we expect the general practitioners to really catch on to really understanding this infection when many consultants are still lacking in the skills, understanding and interest in this condition. Next slide. Case three, 20, 20 year old uni student, sudden onset of vertigo and leg weakness and joint pains and fever. Suddenly, January 6, 2021, um, he was seen, he's from Scotland originally, went to, gone to university, seen by a neurologist at the University Hospital who diagnosed functional neurological disease. That despite the fact he had an abnormal MRI and he had weakness documented in his legs, four out of five. The parents had suggested Lyme as a possible diagnosis. Um, he'd been in Dundee before, Duke, and, Duke of Edinburgh Award student, although he does, he had lots of tick exposures, but never remembers the rash. But this was dismissed by neurology, who refused to do a Lyme test, got a second neurologist to confirm it was FND, but eventually the GP did a Lyme test, and it was strongly positive by standard UK, Scottish, uh, Port and Downs testing. Next slide. So what is FND? Functional urological disorder is a, is a condition of nervous system symptoms that can't be explained by a neurological disease or other medical condition. However, the symptoms are real and cause significant distress or problem functioning. Next slide. So this fellow was too sick to come to, to, to Dublin, actually, very unwell in a rollator, 20 year old, uh, very, very deconditioned uh, nine months later um, after the diagnosis of functional neurological disorder um, had been. So the story was that I took was two, week, two years previously at a, he had a similar episode in March while, while outdoors, vertigo, fever, pains, no rash that resolved uh, in two weeks while, while living in the northern part of Scotland. Um, he was started an antibiotic treatment by me with reduction, but not resolution of all his symptoms. Um, but the neurologists have continued to say this is not Lyme. They want to repeat LLP to rule out Lyme disease. However, his initial LP that he had done actually two weeks after receiving doxycycline was normal. Um, so the question is why perform an LLP to prove that he doesn't have Lyme? and they are sticking to the diagnosis of FND. So there seems to be quite a reluctance of uh, you know, many consultant specialists to, to entertain uh, Lyme as a possibility. Next slide. Case four, um, this has actually been published as a clinical case study uh, and review of the literature by uh, myself and a group, and it's referenced here, PMID. But the title is Persistent Borrelia Infection and response to antibiotic therapy. So the report describes an individual clinically diagnosed with L Lyme disease who initially responded to standard therapy, got better with antibiotic therapy and relapsed when the antibiotics were discontinued. Next slide. Story, 58 year old Irish physiotherapist who traveled to upstate New York, he was bitten. Um, in, in one of the, in, up in the Adirondacks, one late, weeks later, he had an expanding rash ECM with lots of non-specific symptoms, pain, fatigue. He was seen by the GP who did the right thing, clinical Lyme diagnosis, you don't need an antibody test, gave him two weeks of doxycycline, he got better. But his symptoms returned after four weeks, by which time he was back in Ireland. He was seen by an Irish infectious disease doctor who said, you don't have Lyme disease. Um, and and, and um, the Irish test was negative. The patient actually insisted as a, as a medical professional himself on treatment, and he was handed over in private practice uh, by the infectious disease doctor four weeks more of doxycycline. He didn't respond very well. Over the next year, he had to reduce his work to 70 by 70%. Um, he actually had to repeat six uh, tests done by his GP because of persistent sy symptoms that was positive for the screening test in um, the NVRL, the C6 peptide, but he was told must be a false positive. 
He actually then had German tests done. Um, the test was the TICPLEX Plus, which is actually not a German test. It's a, a test developed in Finland, accredited and licensed throughout the world. And it was positive for anaplasma and Borrelia. Next slide. So his symptoms that when I saw one year duration, severe fatigue, abdominal pain, joint pain, muscle pain, cramps, severe neck stiffness and cracking, joint stiffness, intense headaches, confusion, difficulty concentrating, reading, speech problems, mood springs, disturbed sleep. Um, I started them in combination antibiotics, focusing on um, uh, Borrelia, which I thought was, was, was not completely treated, and anaplasma, which is a rickettsial infection. And he returned to full work activities at four months. Next slide. Case five. Uh, 77-year-old retired GP from the Liverpool area. He actually found a tick in his right ankle. He, he then had an ECM rash and systemic symptoms, was given two weeks of doxycycline by his GP with resolution. Two years later, exact same symptoms recur with a rash in the exact same location. He went to the university hospital locally. They actually took a, vulture, a, a, a biopsy of the lesion and sent it for culture. You can actually do PCR and culture for Borrelia and research laboratories. And it was positive for Borrelia, but he was told he'd already been treated, could get no further treatment according to the guidelines. Next slide. He was seen by me in consultation. He'd been unwell for two years. I started him on a combination of low-dose naltrexone and a series of supplements and combination antibiotics. The skin lesion of the right ankle totally resolved, as did all of his symptoms within two months. The question is, why was he not retreated? The guide, guidelines are guidelines, not laws. If you look at other infections, I treat people with TB for one year with four drug TB therapy. 5% of people relapse and you treat them again. So would we retreat the TB patient? Of course. Uh, why do we not treat Lyme patients? Um, because there's this belief that Lyme is gone after two weeks of antibiotics, which, I, which from my experience and from my literature review, is not the situation. Next slide. Case six, 44-year-old nurse from Bristol. He'd been bitten in 2014 in a trip to Holland. He had a rat. He, he pulled the tick off his shoulder, took, got a rash, got two weeks of doxycycline. The rash and the symptoms resolved. Now, four years later, his symptoms returned, and he went on to Germany. To, there's some private clinics there. He received a total of six months of therapy with clinical improvement. But because of COVID, he couldn't return to Germany and his, his, all of his symptoms returned and he lost about 10 kilos. He then developed a swollen left knee that was actually seen in by the, the orthopedics and they had a washout biopsy and on histopathology, they identified Borrelia on the biopsy of, 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 the, of, of the knee synovium. Next slide. He was then told he could receive no further treatment as he had already been treated. I just saw this fellow three, four weeks ago. This was just results from about in the last month. He was evaluated by me, started in combination antibiotics and supplements uh, and LDN. Early days, will he respond to therapy? Um, so my question really, and this is what I'm told time and time again with my colleagues, Lyme is easy to diagnose, it's easy to treat, does not persist. So the question is why? is it's still identified five years later, actually seven years later, in the joint tissue. And why is it still there despite six months of intensive combination therapy? Next slide. So the, the challenge really for Lyme disease and the co-infection is every organ system can be affected. And this is just a list of some of the symptoms of Lyme disease um, by body system. It's not exhaustive. It's a complication of multiple possible symptoms, neurological symptoms, neuropsychiatric symptoms, CNS symptoms, um, and cranial nerve symptoms, including the eye. So, so it affects so many different organs because um, it, it, it disseminates from the original flu-like syndrome through the bloodstream and goes to every tissue of the body and does not just magically disappear. I think it goes into dormancy, small numbers, and then there's this whole cascade of infection, inflammation, and autoimmunity. Next slide. I don't have time really to talk about the other co-infections, but there are a number of other co-infections, 
And they're, they're really poorly characterized, unfortunately, in humans, much better characterized in animals. And they're treated in animals, but not treated in humans. So there's overlap between Lyme disease, Babesia, Ehrlichosis, which is a rickettsial infection. Next slide. Bartonella, mycoplasma, chlamydia, pneumonia, they're not spread by ticks commonly, but they cause some similar symptomatology. And they do have persistent chronic intracellular uh, um, uh, manifestations, and they can persist for a year, well described in the te textbooks. So you'll have access to these slides later, but in the interest of time, I won't go into detail um, you know, in describing co-infections further. Next slide. So I showed this slide before at the last presentation, the medical community has chosen to minimize the complexity of tick-borne infections. But new funding and research, you know, not from the government, not from the NIH, not from the Medical Research Council or the, the Irish HRB, but there's private funding. There's a number of private donors in America who are now putting money and resources into better understanding these conditions. So it's a complex disease, and it's a complex host pathogen interaction in Lyme disease. And there's huge gaps in knowledge and caught in the middle really, I think, are a lot of sick patients who, who are you know, maybe mis, misdiagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, um, functional neurological disease, uh, you know, uh, fibromyalgia. Uh, next slide. So we mentioned this before, the consequences of untreated Lyme disease is if you, if you miss the diagnosis and not everybody sees the tick, not everybody gets the rash, not everybody has a positive test. So I think what we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg, but untreated Lyme disease, 5% carditis, 10% neurological manifestations, uh, cranial nerve palsies, and I mentioned the, nerve, the Bell's palsy can appear years later after the initial infection, 60% arthritis. Next slide. And then this is a condition uh, when people get treated and don't get better, um, post-treatment chronic Lyme disease. And these are studies that are recorded there. You can look them up or you can look them up in the Lyme Resource Center. These are when they've had people who are still PCR or culture or antigen positive uh, for Lyme disease, like the biopsies I showed you. Patients continue with generalized constitutional symptoms, rheumatological symptoms, neurological symptoms, uh, a whole bunch of them as outlined in the slide there. Next slide. So what is post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome? This is a term that's been put together by the Infectious Disease Society of America, and it studies the Hopkins either today. These are people who are, do not achieve total symptom resolution following initial treatment for Lyme disease. They're characterized as having PTLDS, in longitudinal studies of EM positive patients. So these are patients that had well-documented Lyme disease with positive rash. 10% have ongoing fatigue, cognitive impairment, musculoskeletal pain for greater than six months, sometimes 10 years or greater. Um, so the, the story is, is that post-treatment Lyme disease doesn't mean post-infectious, okay? Um, the, the, there's still infection in a subset of patients and on studies by Hopkins, they've actually done PET scans in these patients. And, and, and many of them are, are lighting up um, on PET scans, on, on brain scans. So there's something residual there. Is it infection? Is it non-infection? Since we, we have no PCRs, we have imperfect diagnostics, and you can't biopsy the brain. Um, many people believe, you know, based on the science, that there's chronic persistent infection. Now, they have done placebo-controlled retreatment studies of patients who are persistently unwell after treatment. And then there's the debate. DeLong and Fallon have done analysis that there was benefit. And Klempner, in the very same studies, showed that there was no meaningful clinical benefit. So Klempner looked at three outcomes. And uh, one of the outcomes, which was chronic fatigue, improved on treatment. Um, statistically significant SF, uh, uh, SF36 quality of life questionnaires, P.001 improvements in, in, on patients who were treated with antibiotics, but they didn't improve in some of the other 
uh, criteria. So they said there was no meaningful clinical benefit. So this is used then as saying there is no bad benefit from retreatment. So I encourage you to look at the original studies to do your own assessment. Next slide. So PTLDS, arguments for persistent infections are supported by recent rhesus macaque studies by Embers et al. And there's a Cohen Foundation. Cohen was a hedge funder, seven billion uh, to his uh, value, whose family gets sick with Lyme disease. And he's put about six, uh, 60 million in private funding to research, including this lady from the um, macaque. Uh, there's a primate center in Tulane, Louisiana. And they've actually treated rhesus macaques with a month of doxycycline following inoculation with Borrelia. And despite standard 28 weeks of therapy, they found persistent, intact, metabolically active B. burdorferi following treatment. And com comparable studies have also been done in humans. So Sapi et al., Oski et al., Rudenko et al. have actually done the same studies in humans, shown despite treatment, persistent, uh, PCR and culture positive for Borrelia uh, in their research studies. Next slide. I've mentioned this before that short course antibiotics do not 100% cure Lyme disease. Short term antibiotics fail in 25 to 71% of patients with late stage disease. And these are some of the studies to support that. These are on the Lyme Resource Center. And the guidelines say, now say treat for three weeks. And if, if you're still persistently sick, treat another three weeks. And if you're still sick three weeks after that, then the infection must spontaneously be gone and you can't treat people. But many doctors treat patients, not guidelines. Um, and I, I, I would urge you all just to use, you know, your clinical judgment like you do for every other infectious disease. Um, I treat people for 10 days for cellulitis, but I have patients with lymphedema who have poor um, circulation. They require six weeks of antibiotics to treat their cellulitis in the setting of lymphedema. We treat patients, not guidelines. And if they're continuing to improve on treatment or you treat them and they get better and you stop the treatment, they get, they get worse. I'm just a very simple person, one in one equal two. Uh, that means they had an antibiotic response. And if you stopped it, that means uh, the antibiotics were working and you should treat them for a longer period um, if they're showing clinical benefit. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so similarly, this is the, I showed this slide last week, evidence-based guidelines for the management of Lyme disease and those refer to uh, expert review of anti-infective therapy from 2004 and there's an additional publication, 2014, um, you know, that, that, that you should be treating the patients and the duration of antibiotic therapy should not be prescriptive. Okay, next slide. Now, supportive treatments. You know, I think it's very clear now just with long COVID. Long COVID is a post-infectious inflammatory autoimmune condition. There's lots of evidence coming out now that, that if persistent Lyme infection there was a whole cascade of infection autoimmunity. So I started, when I first treated people with Lyme disease, I treated them, they got better. I stopped the antibiotics, they got worse. And a lot of my patients, this is about five years ago, had been actually adding a lot of supplements uh, themselves. And they said, the thing that got me over the line were the supplements. So I started looking at some of the supplements as a form of immune support. And uh, so I, I started adding a lot of products. There's Revive Active used in Ireland. There's a number of products from Napier's, the herbalist. There's a product called Sublime coming up from Just Herbs. But by my, my turmeric with black pepper is natural anti-inflammatory. N-acetylcysteine has been used for chronic fatigue syndrome. It's converted to glutathione. Probiotics improve gut health. Um, and so, so I've, in addition to antibiotics, um, I've used a number of uh, supportive treatments. And one of the products that I've uh, started using in the last number of years is low-dose naltrexone. I actually used low-dose naltrexone uh, back early on in 1985 in the setting of HIV and AIDS. It was used uh, with patients with HIV who had no um, treatment at that time. And as their, their immune system get worse, they get worsening, worsening immunosuppression, more inflammatory conditions, more 
joint pain, more pain syndrome. So, so LDN placebo controlled trials early on back in the early AIDS epidemic was used and proved benefit for people. There's now been studies, placebo controlled trials used in rheumatology and neurology to support the use for low dose naltrexone. So it's worth looking at for you all who are on the call today, look into the data on LDN. I find it hugely helpful, especially in patients with chronic persistent symptoms uh, following, uh, you know, uh, late diagnosis of Lyme disease or non-resolution of symptoms with, uh, in the setting of Lyme disease. I'm now doing some pilot studies using it for long COVID um, uh, because there's a lot of similarities and hoping we'll have the data published on pilot studies on that within the next few months. Next slide. So is there such a thing as chronic Lyme? IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America says it's gone after two, three weeks. And if you're still sick, get over it, it's post-infectious. But how do you know it's post-infectious? Because we have no PCR or culture-based diagnosis. ILADS, which is the other organization that counters, that actually manages most of the Lyme patients in America, says you should treat the patients, not the guidelines. And many patients get better with longer uh, courses of antibiotics. I'm not suggesting that GPs should be getting into complex regimes for the management of chronically infected patients. But, but, but I, I think it's important to understand that I think the patients are real, their conditions are real, um, and we shouldn't downplay the severity of, of these chronic persistent infections. It's true that if you catch the bite before dissemination, shorter courses are going to work. So GPs, pharmacists on the filing, filing line, I think you have to have a high suspicion. Uh, even if you don't see the tick, even if you don't uh, see the rash, even if the antibody test is negative. If you catch it late, it's clearly harder to treat. And even after treatment, there may be not be complete recovery with antibiotics. Does PTLDS stand for post-treatment? Uh, or maybe the P stands for persistent, or maybe it stands for partially treated. So I think we should all consider that. Next slide. And then um, I think I've highlighted the LimeResourceCenter.com professional learning. And I, we have a list of references going back to the original data and the, 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 the case report that I reported, we're happy to disseminate that has a review of the evidence for chronic persistent infection. So in the interest of time here, I'm just gonna stop and uh, turn it over to Monica and we'll hopefully have time for questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lambert. There was a lot in there, wasn't there? There was a lot in there. And you may wish to go back and go through it all later um, through the recording at a later date. And we know from working with primary care health practitioners that you like to use case studies and have that context and those clinical um, pictures just to really understand it. So thank you very much, Dr. Lambert. It's my pleasure to bring now um, our next speaker, who's Monica Wild. And Monica is highly qualified in medical herbalism. She'll tell us a little more about herself, but she's a research herbalist. And she um, is part of the Napiers, the herbalist group, who are based mainly in the, in the east of Scotland, but have many branches elsewhere now. I'm sure many of you have heard of Napiers. So Monica, delighted to have you here to give us something a little different now. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, I um, work with um, the Napier's Lyme Clinic, and I've been solely focusing on patients with Lyme disease for three years now, having come back from doing some training in the States. And, um, you know, at that time, I realized that just seeing, you know, six or seven patients over the course of the year didn't really give me the insight into the the patterns of the illness and the understanding that I needed. So um, for three years now, I have only seen patients with Lyme disease, which has um, you know, given, given me a lot more insight into the condition. So I'm going to share my screen now and get some slides up for you. Um, here we go. And present. Lovely. 
Okay, so what I really want to do today is um, not to talk to you about the specifics of what Herb does what and how, um, but to talk about generally an integrated medicine approach. Um, the, um, you know, it's too much in 20 minutes to train you in all the herbs and supplements. So I really wanted to convey what resources you can enlist to better support your patients in an integrated medicine approach. And while I've offered a more formal definition here on the slide, integrated medicine for me is when I as a herbalist am able to work with doctors and infectious disease consultants such as Dr. Lambert contributing to a treatment plan for the best outcome for our patients. Integrated medicine was an area that I focused on most during my master's degree anybody wants 33,000 words on herbs and omeprazole, let me know. Um, and it's a fascinating and growing subject. And um, I certainly, people who did masters with me are actually employed as herbal medicine um, um, liaison practitioners in busy practices in America where, you know, where things are being more integrated. But in my practice, I've reached out to patients, GPs, um, with their permission, of course. And I've often found that instead of competition, there can be cooperation. Instead of suspicion, there can be dialogue. And instead of rigidity, there can be open-mindedness. And the end result for the patient is that they get the best of both worlds and a patient-centered route back to health. And I've been working this way for the last sort of three years and really wish that all practitioners had the opportunity to practice like this. Um, it helps to understand what's meant by complementary medicine and what's meant by alternative medicine. Perhaps they shouldn't all be lumped together under CAM or other. I most definitely see my discipline, herbal medicine, as complementary medicine. You know, it can be used in many instances as a standalone treatment, but it can also complement the prescribing by medical doctors. With due care taken to potential interactions, herbs can support many of the body's systems alongside prescription medication. And this is particularly appropriate with a multi-systemic illness, such as persistent Lyme disease. And there's a growing body of clinical evidence that supports this as well. Alternative medicine I see as something different. That is more of an alternative to mainstream medicine and often never the twain shall meet. And these are often disciplines with less or little science or governance behind them. However, the fact that half of the British population uses complementary medicine and across their lifetime, you know, really has to be taken into account. So this could be a really big challenge for a lot of GPs, and I fully understand that this modality of working can be challenging, especially given the overwhelming lack of time faced by many GPs and the lack of an official blueprint or template for this. And when a patient comes in with something they've read about online and would like to try, or the name of an unknown practitioner in an unrecognized discipline, it must often feel that to take the line of do no harm is really the best practice. But as I said, you know, half of your patients will probably use, be using CAM regardless. So you can either dissuade them or ignore the issue or you know, go that little bit further to educate and incorporate the use of CAM with people that you, you trust to work with. And in Lyme disease, you know, are these patients any different? I think they are. You know, the, um, you know, the challenge for patients is getting tests that are accurate. And if the tests are negative, where do they then go? Um, you know, I've put some statistics up there. You know, 23% of patients consult non-NHS medical clinics. You know, what was interesting was that the Royal, Univers the Royal Liverpool University Hospital Study at the Tropical Infectious Disease Unit, um, they found 85% of patients in their study had a positive diagnosis based on overseas tests, which would be primarily from Germany and the States, but all were found not to have Lyme disease by the UK National Reference Laboratories. So patients that are faced with this have this dilemma 
you know, they are symptomatically identifying with Lyme. They've had tests that are positive, but still the UK National Reference Laboratories, um, which uses the older ELISA testing, finds them negative. Where do they go then? You know, very often they turn to complementary medicine. They shop around trying to find solutions. We lack exact data on the UK position, but in America, 95% of patients are diagnosed by primary care physicians, only 5% by the infectious disease specialists. But most patients see more than four doctors before they're diagnosed, creating delays that can profoundly affect their quality of life. And to obtain care, 49% travel over 50 miles, 31%, you know, more than, 50, more than 100 miles for treatment. So it's, you know, it's a real challenge. You know, if, you're, if your patients are going to use complementary medicine practitioners, isn't it better that you um, embrace it to a certain extent? The diagnostic challenge, of course, with, you know, with late Lyme is that it really is multi-systemic and the diagnosis is difficult. Um, I always remind my patients that symptoms are produced by the body, not the bacteria. And that as we only have one or two of most limbs and organs, the body has a limited repertoire in telling us what's wrong. So many symptoms overlap so many other diseases and conditions. But nonetheless, these patients are suffering. GPs are often hamstrung by lack of diagnosis in treating systemically or lack of an NHS pathway for a condition that's poorly described. And with a multi-systemic symptom picture, you could use many drugs simultaneously, yet a high drug load is not desirable in any patient, particularly one without a clear diagnosis. And this is where herbs, which have few side effects when properly prescribed, and I, by that I mean by a herbalist and not experimented with over the counter, can alleviate many symptoms and improve patients' thresh pain thresholds, energy levels, and their quality of life. Um, some patients choose complementary medicine just to be heard. And, you know, this is something where my, you know, my heart really goes out to GPs who are on a tight, you know, five minute or eight minute or 10 minute consultation time. Because after an initial one hour intake appointment with a new patient, I so often hear the words, thank you for listening. No one has truly listened to me. Um, that they feel that way is not the fault of their general practitioner who has time constraints. You know, in a short appointment, it's not possible to investigate the complex and often seemingly random symptoms that a patient presents with. And as symptom patches overlap between so many different conditions, Lyme could be many other conditions. And sometimes an infection is only suspected when a patient who's been chronically ill for years suddenly feels better after a short course of antibiotics for an unrelated condition. Referrals to specialists often result in what I call silo medicine, as not all specialist consultants are able to go cross-discipline when patients are atypical. And my patients often come to me with diagnosis of atypical rheumatoid arthritis or atypical lupus. Um, you know, sometimes it's like patients going off to see a mechanic. You know, they go to their GP who tries to direct them in the best direction. And they go off and the guy looks under the hood and he says, well, it's not spark plugs. And they go, great, what is it? So I don't know, I only deal with spark plugs. And you're sent back to the GP who then tries their best to get you an appointment with the guy who looks at the carburetor and the guy who looks at the carburetor says, well, it's not the carburetor and back you are to your GP. And there does seem to be lacking in the NHS, a um, general medicine practitioners who can stand back and have a overview of all the results coming in from all the different departments. Um, I know that there are general medicine practitioners, but they tend very much to be um, A&E based and looking at people who are coming in with acute conditions to try to triage them to the right discipline. But, you know, it's badly needed for people with, you know, all sorts of long term diseases. We don't know what the UK statistics are, but certainly in the America, you know, 72 percent of um, US patients with Lyme 
are, are often misdiagnosed and often it takes two or more years to correct the misdiagnosis. Um, and, you know, to cap it all, and what makes it most difficult for patients is that over half of them are often classified with a psychiatric disorder um, or not believed, you know, you're making it up. You know, this is, you've got too many different symptoms and you're just making it up. Um, so their quality of life is extremely poor and um, they rate themselves, they rate themselves as having a far worse um, general quality of life than even people with multiple sclerosis and fibromyalgia. So what do they, you know, where do they end up going? Well, um, you know, this survey showed that the majority of them will turn to herbal protocols. Um, you know, our, our experience in our Napius clinic is actually very similar to this um, study um, from my, you know, my, my Lyme data, which I think was over 3000 participants. Um, in the UK, we find that people use, people with Lyme use herbal medicine. Um, they go to functional medicine clinics, which are often very expensive. Um, they have, they use far infrared for saunas bioresonance, rife machines, biomagnetic pair therapy, and hyperbaric oxygen all seem to be the most popular. Um, some have, you know, more effect or seeming effect on than others. And um, certainly none of them should be used as a diagnostic technique, in my opinion, anyway. Um, why is herbal medicine in particular so popular for treating Lyme? Well, a lot of work was done, you know, going back to, um, you know, really starting in the late 1990s um, with Stephen Harrod Booner um, and the herbalist Julie McIntyre. Um, he wrote these three very in-depth technical books on the treatment of Lyme disease and the co-infections with herbs, as well as herbal antibiotics and herbal antivirals. Um, they, they ran a clinic together for over 15 years, specializing in the treatment of Lyme disease and chronic bacterial and viral infections and treated thousands of patients and also ran an extensive online forum. And these books um, pioneered herbal treatments that patients initially turned to to treat themselves. And they also spawned a lot of the um, over-the-counter protocols like the Cowden protocol, which were often very low dose herbs because you know, they don't have the professionals to deal with people having reactions or side effects. Um, but you know, like drugs, you know, herbs are best um, administered by trained professionals. Um, what then happened after this period was that the herbal medicines that were brought to prominence in treating Lyme were studied for their um, antimicrobial effects in vitro and there's been a lot of peer reviewed studies published. And I just thought I'd show you a couple of pages just of a list. Um, any of these can be supplied to people who want afterwards. But just so that you understand that there is actually some strong evidence behind what we do. Um, you know, we can show that in vitro cryptolepis or Ghanaian quinine is just as strong as many antibiotics. Japanese knotweed. Chinese skull cat, black walnut, South American cat's claw, Artemisia annua. They're all antimicrobial against Lyme as well, and many of the co-infections. So if you're working with a herbalist um, or a patient is being referred to a herbalist, um, who should you go to? I think a lot of people don't realize that herbalists are actually trained professionals. Um, most of them will have to have a BS. Uh, you know, Bachelor of Science degree or, or equivalent accreditation. You know, this can take anywhere from, you know, three years at full, full time at university like Lincoln, um, up to six years for people who are doing part time self study, plus 500 um, clinical hours, supervised clinical hours, before people can practice and become part of a self governing organization. Um, under the previous Labour government, we were going to be regulated, which many of us, you know, embraced. Unfortunately, once the Conservatives got in, they decided to send us back behind the hedges again. Um, but, you know, if, you're, if a herbalist that your patient is working with is a member of one of these organisations, there are also some 
um, organizations for people experienced in Chinese herbal medicine, um, then you'll know that they do have to meet certain um, standards and they have been trained in anatomy, physiology, pathology, diagnostic medicines, uh, diagnostic procedures. And, um, and above all, they will do things like um, ask patients what medication they're on and check for contraindications. Um, so that's really, you know, important. Um, and, you know, why do people, you know, seek professional herbalists or why is it useful? to, you know, if you were part of a big practice to actually have a herbalist on your team. There are a few practices throughout the UK where they actually have herbalists working in the, the clinics alongside doctors. Um, and, uh, you know, I've put many reasons up there, but I think, um, you know, the overriding one is that, um, you know, we do have more time to actually take a case history you know, starting at, you know, when, when were you, you know, when you were born, was it a natural birth? Did you have a lot of childhood illnesses? Um, you know, very often you build up a picture of people and realize that, um, you know, their health in some ways was a car crash waiting to happen. And Lyme was what tipped them over the edge um, and really didn't help. Um, and tailored, you know, tailored um, protocols are prescribed for patients. Um, you know, it takes a lot, it takes a lot into consideration um, and also looks at diet and lifestyle and stress. You know, we know that poor diet undermines the immune system. We know that the high amounts of stress undermine the immune system as well. So just to give you an idea of, um, you know, the approach that I take when I'm working, um, you know, from the detailed clinical assessment, you know, we look at, you know, is there chronic anxiety? So we might get them to start something like autogenic training, which used to be available on the NHS in Edinburgh. I don't think it still is. You know, are there sleep problems? Let's get the sleep problem. You know, are there gut issues? Because then they're going to need dietary changes. Um, if the patient has had, um, you know, a tick bite with an EM rash, you know, it's very clear what is going on. But if not, but there's, you know, suspect line, you know, does the patient have test results? So there's a lot that we'll sort of go through um, and look at before looking at how we treat. You know, if they're not on antibiotics, we may use specific, you know, antibiotic herbal prescription. Um, they will always be supported for their immune system with herbs that are immunomodulating, not overly stimulating because Lyme patients have to tend to have Th1 and Th2 up. And um, if anything, are more likely to have sort of histamine and, you know, um, mast cell activation types sort of responses. So very much immune balancing, strengthening and modulating with adaptogens. And then, you know, pain relief for joints or calming, you know, herbs that will help to calm neurological symptoms and so on. Um, and we, you know, follow them up. We reevaluate. We see them normally once a month in the first three months. And then as they start to improve, go to a sort of three months and then eventually a six month protocol. But in general, with patients with Lyme, I'm normally seeing them for, you know, um, you know, one, you know, one to two years, you know, I would say 12 to 24 months. Um, if they've been doing um, antibiotics and have done well on the antibiotics, probably just 12 months afterwards um, to make sure that they um, aren't going to go backwards and relapse. Um, this is a slightly more technical slide that, which, that shows you um, from a, a published paper, a more integrated medicine approach specifically here to neuroborreliosis. Um, just to give you an idea of I've really I just texted Rebecca, asked her if she might be free in about 15 minutes. Okay, sorry. Am I running out of time? What was he? No, you're, you're fine, Monica. I think we had just, we'd interference from somebody's microphone being on, so you're doing fine for time. Carry on. Oh, all right. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I couldn't quite hear that person. Um, okay. Um, I just wanted to also talk um, in, you know, a little bit about, you know, who gets um, Lyme. 
Um, because, you know, why some people get Lyme and some people don't is quite a fascinating subject. Um, you know, I analyzed these, you know, 15 papers from 1986 to about 2011, um, where health and safety executives were testing people working in forestry in case there was a big, you know, implication for, you know, health and safety payouts for people working in forestry. And on average, 20 you know, 24% in the UK had antibodies to Borrelia on the ELISA test. So, you know, given the inaccuracy of that testing, possibly a lot more, probably a lot more people in forestry, you know, have antibodies to Borrelia. So they've been bitten by a tick, but only about, you know, 3.7% on average actually get symptoms. And given that our clinic is in Scotland, and in the last three years we've treated over 1,400 Lyme patients, you would think that our clinic would be full of people working in forestry and um, mountain climbing and rural pursuits because, you know, that's what a lot of the ecology of Scotland is. But yet the majority are UK-wide city dwellers with brief rural exposure. And, you know, this has, is, this is, you know, really um, interested me. And, you know, going back to what I said about, you know, looking at life events, you know, leading up to a car crash in slow motion, I, I thought I'd give you one example. You know, I had a patient who was bitten at the age of 15, suffered flu-like symptoms and a classic bullseye rash. She was promptly diagnosed and given three weeks of doxycycline. She'd always been healthy before then and the infection appeared to go away. 30 years later, at the age of 45, she'd had a tumultuous relationship breakup following several years of stress. Um, she left her partner and then her home, quit her job, and went traveling. In the Philippines, she was bitten by a mosquito and came down with a malarial type infection, um, which exhausted her. But she seemed to recover from that. And yet three months later, completely crashed and had been wiped out for about six months by the time I saw her. And the Ellie Spot blood test showed that she was highly Lyme positive at that point. So it does appear that it was dormant, but kept in check by her immune system for some 30 years until the lifestyle factors that created the terrain for an off guard weak immune system. You know, it reminds me of Louis Pasteur's rival, Andre Béchamp, who argued that microbes became dangerous when the health of the host, its terrain or its environment was compromised. And while Béchamp was wrong about, you know, quite a few things, his idea that microorganisms are necessary to good health and that beneficial microbiota can become pathogenic under the wrong conditions or in the wrong place is now the standard view of researchers who study the microbiology of animals and plants. Or to quote Florence Nightingale, there are no specific diseases, there are specific disease conditions. So, so much of Lyme boils down to the status of the immune system at the point of infection. And even when patients have done well on antibiotics, if the immune system isn't strengthened and the underlying factors that led to the immune compromise aren't sorted out, um, they're likely to relapse. And this is where I feel that herbs and diet can really help patients. So supporting the immune system really is the key. And I find this quote that I put up here by Dr. Jack Weaver particularly accurate. You know, we all know that the immune system can be derailed by poor diet, stress, anxiety, post-viral weakness, drugs and alcohol. And many bacterial infections are easily identified and eliminated by the immune system, but for some patients, acute and chronic infections cause a dysregulated immune response. And Lyme in particular undermines the immune system in its attempt to evade it. Um, so a disruption of any of the, the, the body systems can have a really negative impact on the quality of life for patients. And herbs, nutritional support, counselling, dietary advice, life coaching and other natural methods can help to promote their immune health and su provide support for the long haul. Lyme is also um, a great, you know, great imitator. I find that, you know, some of the arguments about whether or not someone has Lyme is because there are so many overlaps with other conditions. 
and many patients come with multiple diagnoses of other conditions. Now, it's not really a question of either or, but sometimes of and as well, because you know, Lyme you know, initiates and triggers conditions, um, particularly autoimmune thyroiditis, for example. It aggravates you know, many others um, and amplifies other things. I have um, you know, a twin patient in um, Spain who consults with me, and um, both she and her twin have inherited Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And what is so interesting is that the twin with the infection, with the Lyme infection, has, had, has, has been so much worse than the twin who doesn't. Um, and that's only since the infection, because up until that point, they, were both, they both were symptomatic in the same way. Um, I also find that in some patients, you know, short term or long term antibiotics can make a world of difference. Um, you know, some people literally get their lives back from being bed bound for years when they have long term antibiotics. But others, they don't help as much or they only go so far and the patient's improved, but still symptomatic. And this is very often when another condition has been triggered that's running alongside the Lyme and, um, and still needs to be treated as well. So a lot of what we do in the hours that we spend with patients is teasing out the symptom patterns to help identify when patients have other underlying or concurrent conditions that need additional treatment. And, you know, I do think sometimes that, you know, the patients start off with, you know, with Lyme and that the antibiotics do kill the bacteria, but because of the damage that's been done by Lyme to them, um, they don't, you know, get as, you know, get as better as they can. Um, I have one patient in Ireland at the moment who, um, you know, when he came off um, a long-term course of antibiotics, um, had improved somewhat, but still didn't feel that he could get to the bottom of his garden gate and back to the house without having to go and have a lie down. And he'd given up all hope. He's now not only climbing mountains, he's just doing his course as a mountain leader. And, you know, says that, you know, seven years ago, he couldn't even have dared to hope that he would ever get past his garden gate again. You know, and that is all that all came about, um, you know, after he'd come off the antibiotics. And I'd been treating him for six months before we found um, the right combination or before his body finally started to catch up and review, you know, and get strong, too. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to, you know, continue the dialogue and, you know, at another time to go much more into detail about the herbs. But, you know, I know that you're all busy and, you know, herbal training is something that's, um, you know, possibly you're not going to be able to undertake. But there are people out there that you can work with. So I just wanted to thank you for listening and just to also suggest three extremely good books, particularly um, the one by Dr. Daniel Kindelera, Recovery from Lyme Disease which I think are, they're not books about herbal medicine, they're just books that are incredibly important for GPs. Thank you. Monica, thank you very much. Um, as we were saying to the audience, something probably quite different from what you are used to listening to. And we hope it will give you some more tools in your armament as primary care practitioners to consider. And I think the importance of that message about immune support is really critical as well. I think some of you remember Dr. Lambert talking about the three eyes, the importance of dealing with the infection, the inflammation and supporting the immune system. So perhaps you can take some of that away with you and have a wee think around that. And, and also that, you know, if a patient does get a diagnosis of something like, you know, atypical rheumatoid arthritis, that doesn't necessarily mean they don't have Lyme as well. Thank you for that, Monica. So I'm delighted we can open our chat box now and encourage you to put your questions in there. Um, I've had a few through already. Um, and 
if you put your questions in there, we've got Professor Lambert and Monica with us. We've also got Dr. Anne Cruikshank and Dr. Zara Hussain. So any of those um, doctors and uh, Monica as the herbalist will be happy to take your questions. Here, here's one here. Um, could you please advise as to when and whether to do a blood test for Lyme disease if someone wishes it, having been bitten by a tick two days previously, but no EM rash? So we, we covered a little for that last week, but um, I'm wondering if um, Dr. Cruikshank would maybe like to take that one for us, please. Yeah, no, I think there would be, uh, if that was the only tick bite, there would be no um, reason to carry out a, a test. And I think the importance here is for GPs to have confidence in explaining why, because um, it won't help either way. It won't exclude it. And it's very, it's not going to confirm it at two days post post bite highly likely so you either need to wait a bit longer give them clear instructions on what to look out for make sure you've recorded in the notes that they presented with concerns over a tick bite so that if you, they come back at sooner or later that's all there in the information so it's it's confidence in saying no you don't need that test at the moment but we're happy to see you if there's a problem thank you Anne. that's helpful can I just add something there? Um, so as well as what Anne has mentioned, um, it's understanding what the test does. So it, like has been mentioned, it's not a direct test of an infection. It's a, a test of the body's immune response to the infection. And that can take a while to happen. So there's some interesting work done by um, Orcott in the States where they've looked at how long it takes for people to develop an immune response to um, Borrelia and it can vary from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. So they certainly won't have a positive test at two days because their body won't have generated an immune response. So logically there isn't, it, it's not a helpful test in that setting. Um, so that's that, that helps you understand the background of why it isn't appropriate at that time frame. Good additional comment. When, why, when you put somebody on PEP for HIV, you do a blood, HIV test follow up at four to six weeks. When you somebody's exposed to syphilis, you have to do the repeat syphilis test up to three months afterwards. So it's called a window period. It's not unique to Lyme disease. It's 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 true for every infection, including Lyme. Thank you very much. So issues there about consistency of approach as well, isn't there? Thank you. Here's a different question. There's a vaccination for tick encephalitis. Will there ever be a vaccine against Lyme? Okay, there, there were two vaccines licensed. I was in the Data Safety Monitoring Board when I was at Hopkins, their vaccine group, um, in 1997. So there was two vaccines licensed, uh, one by Connaught. I was on their Data Safety Monitoring Board, and there was a second company. But... They, they, they were licensed and then actually they, they were withdrawn from the market. So there have been, and it's not clear whether it just wasn't the popular or whether there was kind of immune kind of side effects and the company was afraid of litigation. It's not really clear, but there are a couple of new Lyme vaccines in biotech companies in development um, going through phase two and three phase testing. Um, but, but like I said, we, we've gone through this back in 1995-96. Um, so so there, are, there are concerns, I think, that the vaccine could be have adverse immuno, immunogenetic uh, side effects for people maybe who already had Lyme disease. Um, but there are some being developed right now. Thank you for that, Dr. Lambert. Um... Here's a slightly different question. Um, someone's asked that um, they found bioresonance and RIFE helpful. Some of you may not know what that is, so we may have to explain that, of course. Having been treated extensively with antibiotics for late Lyme, they then found bioresonance and RIFE helpful. And they're aware of others who've also benefited who've had late stage Lyme. Um, have Dr. Lambert and Monica have any experience of patients using this and any positive reports to give? Yeah, well, look, I, I have lots of patients that I, I've got no idea what it is, to be perfectly honest. But, and, and we're, we're herbalists and infectious disease doctors here, so I don't think we're really able to say, but, but patients have said it hasn't, helped, it hasn't hurt them, and in some situations it helped them. 
So, so, um, so I can say nothing more except that people haven't had adverse effects and some people have shown benefit. Thank you. Monica? Yes, I, I would agree with that. Um, I don't know a huge amount about it. Um, and I haven't, you know, managed to find many papers that have educated me um, about it. I'd love to know more about how it how it does work. Um, all I would say is that I am very wary of um, bioresonance or a biomagnetic pair therapists um, diagnosing people. Very often people come to me and say, my biomagnetic pair therapist, you know, told me I had, you know, a, a certain co-infection or whatever. And, you know, sometimes, you know, they, when they have blood tests done, they're right. I think, you know, if you see a lot of patients, um, you know, you start to see patterns. Um, but, you know, very often they're wrong, but then the patient is in a real quandary as to what to believe the blood test or their nice bioresonance practitioner as well. So I tend to get a bit, you know, um, arsy when I'm presented, presented with diagnostics. But, you know, um, you know, as a, as a form of treatment, I don't I don't think that it's harmed anybody that I've, I've I haven't had the experience where it's harmed anybody. May I make a comment on, on that? Um, Kate, would you like to make a comment? I don't know if your sound's working terribly well, but try again. I think your broadband's maybe struggling. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're mute and we're struggling to hear you. Can, you. can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. I just wanted to make a comment because Having, I've had a long career in the NHS as a nurse. And um, I would have been very, very cynical about some of these treatments until I'm happy. I just probably helped me the most, actually, out of all the things. Um, and I, but I would have certainly never believed that until I became a Lyme patient myself. So I just wanted to raise a word. That's helpful. That's helpful, Kate. So what you're saying is you would have previously been quite cynical about um, treatment and approaches like that, but having been on the other side of the equation, you've actually found them helpful. So that's useful to hear, isn't it? Um, yes. Sort of lived experience. But it, it is, and I, I said- many are really- Sorry, sorry. Kate, I think you're no, really I'm struggling tonight. So I'm maybe get you to put any comment in the chat box if that's all right, because I think your broadband's struggling a bit. Thank you, Monica. You know, I do think it's important to keep an open mind and, you know, patients do know what works for them and what doesn't. Um, I think it's just a shame that, you know, communities of practitioners can't get together to at least publish you know, series of case studies or, you know, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a sort of full scale clinical trial, but at least case studies and other things so that other people can understand um, and through understanding then trust what they may refer people to. Okay, thank you for that, Monica. Maybe scope there for, for groups to get together to, to talk a bit deeper in this. So here's a few other questions. Um, I think we're, we're at the stage where we're almost at 8.15, but we're very happy to stay on for another 15 minutes. So I hope you'll stay with us. Um, is there a time when it's too late to treat? Who would like to take that one? Dr. Lambert? No, no, I, I don't think it is. I mean, I think that's the issue. I think, I, I mean, I, I, my review of the literature is Lyme can persist just like syphilis can persist for years and years. They're both spirochetes. Um, they don't just miraculously disappear without treatment. So, so yes. So I think if you've got somebody who's late diagnosed with Lyme and you take the accurate history, I've, I've seen people years later respond to antibiotic therapy against Lyme. So, so I think you should, you should give people the benefit of the doubt of a treatment if you have taken the appropriate history 
and you suspect Lyme disease based on your history and the findings and whether or not there's, you know, there's, um, you know, there's actually laboratory data to support it. I think I have seen patients respond to treatment and I think it's within, it's within, it's a reasonable thing to do. And I think the additional thing is, is that you hear, you hear this all the time. Uh, my Lyme symptoms improved when I took antibiotics for something else, you know, that there's lots of tips and hints and questioning people um, that, that I think would support that treating them even further down the line than early diagnosis. Thank you very much. That's I would definitely agree with that. You know, I've, I've had patients who've been ill 20 or 30 years and have yet managed to make significant improvement. I think sometimes the, you know, having had an infection for so long, you know, some damage has been done and whether or not people can be restored to, you know, 100% health, particularly as, you know, several decades have gone by and we're all getting older anyway. Um, but certainly people can can get a good quality of life back again, even, even when they've been ill for a very long time. Thank you. So here's a couple of questions for Dr. Lambert. I'm going to take them both together here. Um, at what point, if at all, would Dr. Lambert use disulfiram? Anti abuse, as some of you would maybe know it. And are there any other pipeline drugs for chronic Lyme? Two questions there. Okay, so my response, I'd never used disulfiram. Um, you know, disulfiram, I, I actually reviewed the article for the, uh, for the, the journal that the data was published in. I was the editor for that journal. And, you know, somebody decided for people who had failed all other therapies to use disulfiram, and they reported three cases of it. And in three cases, people got symptomatic improvement for 18 months. But subsequent studies have kind of shown in a group of 70 to 80 people, about 40% of people responded, but about 60% of people had toxicities. So um, I think, you know, that three cases of improvement in people doesn't mean that everybody should be jumping on the bandwagon to, to treat with this, a drug that's, you know, poorly understood and may have significant toxicity. Now, on the other side, disulfiram is similar to flagell in terms of the way it looks. So it may have activity against Borrelia and, I told you the Cohen Foundation has put millions and they've actually are supporting the Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Tulane, and actually Stanford to do studies on, on, on disulfiram. So I think, yes, it may be a benefit, but it's early days. And I think um, we're jumping the gun by, you know, putting that top of the line to treat people or even bottom of the line. So, so I'm not saying it's not going to work, but I just think that, um, we, we shouldn't be uh, jumping on the, the next flavor of the month. Uh, so second off, there are some new antibiotics coming along and uh, some of the publications that, um, that are coming out of Johns Hopkins and Yang, uh, they've, they've looked in vitro at the activity of a lot of different herbs, a lot of different antibiotics. So lots of different antibiotics have activity against Lyme. However, there's no funding to do clinical trials, safety and efficacy studies. So I think I, I would hold off on jumping to too many new agents um, and stick with what we know works. Thank you for that, that's helpful. Um, question here about the, the case that you raised, Dr. Lambert. Um, where Borrelia was isolated from the joint aspirate, why would it not be treated, do you think? Um, and the questioner saying it makes no clinical sense not to offer therapy because the individual already received it earlier in the, in the disease process. Would you like to comment on that one? Not really. Uh, I mean, it puzzles me why, why, why we are, are paralyzed in treating Lyme disease beyond the prescribed you know, guidelines. Uh, we don't use that for any other infectious disease. So you'll have to ask the people who chose not to treat the patients, not me. Maybe, maybe Anne can make a comment. I was also going to say it's important to remember that just because a patient has been treated in the past doesn't mean they haven't actually been reinfected. It may well be a chronic infection, but there's also the issue of reinfections if they're in the same, uh, the same tick exposure they had previously. So, um, you know, which might be weeks, months, even years later, but it, yeah, I would start again, I would retreat. 
So thank you. Thank you, Anne. And there's one here, it's addressed to Dr. Lambert, but I'm actually going to give it to you. Um, if, if you were bitten by a tick, would you take doxycycline as soon as possible, i.e. just in case? If you're asking me, then no. Um, there wouldn't be a good argument for that. Uh, otherwise, you may be taking it repeatedly. Um, and I think actually Dr. Lambert's opinion is even more significant as an infectious diseases consultant. I, I answered that question last week in the question and answer. I'm just, just saying very simply, um, you know, I, I think uh, some, some guidelines say go ahead and, you know, give prophylactic, you know, doxycycline or, or short course doxycycline. If I was in Old Lyme, Connecticut, where 70% of the ticks are positive for Borrelia, um, you know, versus in, you know, in, uh, you know, parts of, you know, uh, of Western Scotland, where it's 1% to 5%, I think I'd wait and watch, but I'd be very clearly say to the patient, if you start to develop any symptoms, you know, consistent with Lyme fever, flu, pains, this and that, not just in a few months afterwards, but even longer beyond, I, I think I think people can present later. So I st still think if, if the GP has seen somebody, um, if you choose not to put people on treatment early uh, following a tick bite, which I wouldn't in most situations, I think you have to clearly document they did have, a did have a tick bite. And if they do develop symptoms, even months and months later, if not years, um, I'm seeing cases of Lyme reactivating years later, I think you should have a low threshold for treating at that time. But that's not prophylaxis, that's treatment at that stage. Thank you. That's a, a really clear and depth answer there. And here's one that's talking about hyperbaric oxygen. So Monica, you may have some views and some of our uh, doctor colleagues too. Hyperbaric oxygen is often used by MS patients. Are you aware of it being used by Lyme disease patients? Yes, some of my patients do use it and some of them have reported that they find it very helpful. Um, the difficulty is that it's very expensive and, um, you know, over half of my patients are already on a, you know, low income rate. So affordability of treatment is a big issue for a lot of patients. Um, I would just say, actually, um, scattered around the UK, the MS charity has um, quite a lot of these treatment sites. And um, far as I'm aware, it's something like £30 for a, a treatment which is an hour. Um, the idea is people go in, sit, in, sit on a plastic chair with a mask on and they have several people in there at the same time. Um, and I know that some MS patients use it regularly on that basis. So it would be less expensive than the individual chambers, but there are only a few of them scattered around the country. I'm not sure how many. Thank you for that, Anne. Um, and there's one question here, I'm not quite sure I follow it, um, demographical chart that shows prominent infected tick in Scotland. Um, I'm not sure if the questioner is asking, are there charts that talk about prominent areas or um, is it something different? Perhaps we can pick that question up um, in an email to the Lyme Resource Centre afterwards and we can perhaps point in the direction of, of some of that um, graphical information. So I think that's bringing us to the end of our questions now. This is, this is your chance if you have any last burning questions there. But of course, if you're like me, they'll probably come to you at midnight tonight, just as you're trying to, just to get to sleep. That's often the way, isn't it? But I think as we come to the close of our session tonight, I have to thank all of our speakers um, over the last three weeks. Each of them has given their time freely to these events and they've come for the question and answer session each week as well. So I'm sure like you, if we were in a room together, we would be, we'd be giving them a, you know, our round of applause just to say thank you. We appreciate you giving your time and your expertise. Um, I also want to just say thank you to you, the audience, for coming and joining us. You've been um, very faithful in coming week after week. And um, what we've promised to do in, in, uh, in return and to help is to send each of you who've registered for tonight and the previous sessions a copy of the recorded sessions. Now, we think we can get those out to you in the next week or so. Um, 
we will actually be putting the full presentations up on the LRC website and that'll take a little longer, maybe be a month or so, but we'll certainly send the links to you then. I hope you found it really helpful. I hope you found it insightful and valuable just in knowing where to go for the information that you need in clinical practice. I suppose most importantly, I hope that we've been helped to open minds and, and thoughts around the complexities and the complications of diagnosing and treating Lyme disease. But I think as far as primary care goes, and that's my pharmacy colleagues, my nursing colleagues, my GP colleagues, all of you, it's about that absolute importance of considering and identifying Lyme disease early, correctly identifying it, diagnosing it and treating it appropriately. And then we catch it at that stage uh, to save people going down the route of those that Dr. Lambert talked about tonight. So I hope in practice, maybe that'll give you that early warning, thinking of, could it be Lyme? You know, before we think about what else it could be as well. So thank you all for attending. Um, we'd love your feedback on the evaluation form that Gordana sent to you earlier today. We really do take notice of your feedback. And please do link with us at LRC. Keep in touch with us. We would love to send you information about what we're doing as well. And um, we hope to do more of these educational sessions in the future so that more and more colleagues can become aware of the importance of this new great imitator and so that we can help um, patients in greater numbers. So I'm Arlene Braley, pharmacist and trustee with LRC. Love to hear from any of you on a personal basis as would our trustees and our uh, colleagues, medical colleagues tonight. And Monica, of course, you can reach through um, Napier's The Herbalist. So thank you all very much. I wish you a very good evening. It's always lovely to finish a couple of minutes early and um, I hope you have a good evening and I hope we hear from you and we can keep in touch with you in the future too. Thank you very much. Thank you. I should also have said a huge thank you to those behind the scenes, which is Gordana and Tina, never forgotten and always appreciated. So a late but sincere thank you to them as well.